Well, good evening and Merry Christmas and welcome to the Cord Street United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Jeremy Peters. Tonight I'm coming to you live from the sanctuary in downtown Flint. I know for many Court Streeters, Christmas doesn't feel like Christmas until you've had a chance to sing in this place and light candles at the end of our Christmas Eve worship right here in the pews at Court Street. And I know that for many of us, it's heartbreaking and frustrating and strange not to be able to be in this place tonight. And my hope tonight for the next half hour is that in the things that we say and do and sing online, you will feel connected to this place you will feel connected to one another, and you will feel connected, most importantly, to God. And part of the good news of the Christmas story is that all of the emperors and kings and evil powers of this world could not stop Jesus from coming. And tonight, we believe that all of the pandemics and distancing and fear of this moment will not keep Jesus from coming again tonight. We're going to begin our worship with a song. Take a deep breath as we sing together number 234 in the United Methodist hymnal, O Come All Ye Faithful. Well, welcome back to the sanctuary at Court Street United Methodist Church. 
So this has been a little bit of a, a taste of everything that we've experienced in the last few months. We've discovered that we had some technical difficulties, and so most of you will have missed the very first part of the service tonight. We'll make sure that we get a full recording of tonight's service online for everyone to enjoy in days to come. For now, the thing you need to know is that Jesus is here. He's here in this place. He is where you are, and we're going to reach out to Jesus in prayer. Now, one of the things that we were telling the world when we tell the Christmas story, is that God loves this world. God loves this world enough to send God's only Son into this world to heal this world and to save this world. And one of our Christmas traditions is to pause every Christmas Eve to pray for this world that God loves and all the people in it. Take a deep breath and let's approach God in a moment of prayer. God, someone is weary tonight. Go to the place where that person lives and give the rest that only you can give. God, someone is feeling helpless tonight. Go to the place where that person lives and make the promises that only you can make. Someone is feeling afraid tonight. Go to the place where that person lives and give the comfort that only you can give. Someone is feeling sadness tonight. Go to the place where that person lives and give the hope that only you can give. God, someone is feeling unwell tonight. Go to the home where that person lives. And give the healing that only you can give. God, we pray that you would fill this place, fill our homes, fill our hearts with the peace and joy of your eternal kingdom. God, we pray for your kingdom to come and heal our souls and heal this world. And we ask it in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, now let's turn to God with another song. The next song we're going to sing is number 238 in the United Methodist hymnal, Angels We Have Heard on High.
we continue tonight with a scripture reading. Listen for God's voice as we hear these words from the Gospel of Luke. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, in the years that I've been a pastor, I've had a few opportunities to go and, and take a trip to the Holy Land. I always come back feeling like I've learned something, some new way of seeing the stories of the Bible, some new understanding of Scripture that I didn't have before. I feel like it's been a great learning experience to stand in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed on the night he was arrested. And when I read the stories in the Gospels about the ministry of Jesus in Galilee, I can close my eyes and I can picture the waters of the Sea of Galilee and the little fishing villages where Jesus first called his disciples. And I've been to the little town of Bethlehem. It's a powerful and a moving experience, even though Bethlehem today doesn't look much like it did back in Jesus' time. I'm a believer in the power of travel, and I spend a lot of time encouraging people to, to go somewhere new, to go to the Holy Land. I encourage all followers of Jesus who have the opportunity to go and walk in the places where Jesus walked. I especially encourage pastors to make a trip to the Holy Land, to learn to see the Bible in 3D, as I heard one pastor put it. In all the years that I've been inviting and encouraging people and pastors to go to the Holy Land, though, there is one person, one pastor, who has steadfastly and stubbornly resisted every invitation I've made. And that's the pastor who's married to my mom. Now, my mom is married to a United Methodist pastor, and he is a tremendously good pastor. He's a role model and a mentor for me in many ways. He's somebody I look up to. He's been doing this a lot longer than I have, which is why it's been so strange for me to have the same conversation with him over and over again. For years, I've been encouraging him to go and take a trip to the Holy Land, a place he's never been, a place he's spent decades talking about and preaching about. I've even invited to take him along myself. I said, come with me. I will, I will show you around. I will get you on the plane myself. And every time I bring it up, he shuts the conversation down. He says, nope, not going, not going to do it, not interested at all. And so finally one day I asked him, what is it about the Holy Land that makes you not want to go? Why, why don't you want to take one of these trips with me? And so finally he told me. He said, well, it's like this. He said, in my head, I have this picture of the Holy Land. And the picture I have in my mind when I read the Gospels comes from the old flannel grams that my Sunday school teachers used to teach me these stories. Now, if you don't know what flannel grams were, ask your parents or maybe your grandparents. This is how Sunday school teachers made things visual before the age of YouTube. He said, I have this flannel gram picture of the Holy Land in my head, he said, and I am afraid that if I go over there, I'm going to discover that it's not at all like the picture I have in my mind. He said, I don't want to lose that picture. I don't want to ruin it. I don't want to find out that it's not the way I've been picturing it all of these years. Well, I can understand that. It's hard to let go of these pictures that we've held on to for so long. It's hard to change. It's hard to alter the pictures of these stories that we learn from our Sunday school teachers. For example, how would you feel if I were to tell you that the Christmas story, as you learned it from your Sunday school teachers, is wrong in one important fact? Maybe it makes you feel anxious. Maybe you're ready to turn off the live stream. But it's true. 
I mean, if you grew up around the church, then you probably learned the Christmas story the same way I did. You probably learned the Christmas pageant version of the story. It's the story that goes like this. Mary and Joseph roll into Bethlehem, and they're tired because they've had a long journey. And so Joseph tries to find a place for them at the Motel 6. But the man at the front desk says, sorry, all of the rooms are taken. And then either out of compassion or because he's trying to make a buck off of this young and vulnerable couple, he says, but, he says, I can let you stay in the stable out back. And so Mary and Joseph go around to the back of the Motel 6 and they make a place for themselves there among the animals. And that's where Jesus is born. He's born in a shed behind a Motel 6 in a cold and inhospitable world. That's the way I learned the story from my Sunday school teachers growing up. What my Sunday school teachers didn't tell me, what maybe they didn't know, is that for a long time now, Bible scholars have known that that version of the story is wrong in one important point. It's wrong because of a mistranslation. For many, many years now, Bible scholars have known that the word that we translate as in, as in there was no room at the inn, should probably actually be translated spare bedroom. The way that the story goes, the way the Bible actually tells it, is more like this. Mary and Joseph pull into the little town of Bethlehem. They're tired because they've had a long journey. And so they go to the home of Joseph's family. And because they've had to travel the farthest and it took them so long to get there, they're the last ones to arrive for this great big family gathering. The house is already filled with aunts and uncles and cousins and nieces and nephews. And Mary would love the privacy and the peace and quiet of the spare bedroom. But Grandma's already set up in there, and nobody's going to kick Grandma out. So Mary and Joseph set up in the most comfortable place that they can find. They set up next to the animals. Now back in those days, many people would have had a place, a room in their houses for the animals. Every night they would have brought in their goats and their donkeys. They did this for a couple of reasons. They brought their animals inside to keep them safe from wild animals and from bandits. And they also brought the animals inside to keep the house warm. All of that livestock would have acted as a sort of ancient central heating system. In the most cozy, the most comfortable, the warmest place in the whole house would have been in the living room right next to where the animals were kept. That's where Mary and Joseph set up their beds. That's where Mary gives birth to Jesus, not in a shed behind the Motel 6, but surrounded by Joseph's female relatives who would have held her hand and comforted and coached her through the birthing process. And then all of those aunts and grandmothers would have taken the baby and passed Jesus around so Mary and Joseph could get some rest. Jesus wasn't born in a shed behind a Motel 6. He was born in a house filled with love, that's a different way of looking at the story than how I learned it when I was growing up, but I've always felt like that's a change for the better. I've always felt like that change enhances the story. It doesn't ruin the story for me. I love the idea that Jesus was born in a house filled with love. In the last year, more than ever before, our homes, our houses have become our places of worship and the places where we grow close to God. Our homes have become our sanctuaries and our Sunday school classrooms. And this might seem strange to us. It might seem like a new thing, but really this is just the Christian faith going back to where it all started. Jesus was born in a home filled with love. And then when he began his ministry, Jesus preached and taught in living rooms and dining rooms wherever people would welcome him. And then in the early years of the Christian faith, Christians, followers of Jesus, didn't worship in special buildings. They worshiped in each other's homes. Part of the promise of the Christ Christmas story, part of the promise of the Christian faith, has always been that God will dwell among us, that God will meet us where we are, that God will meet us where we live, that God will meet us in our homes. How will you make a space in your home for Jesus in 2021? How will you make a place in your heart for Jesus in the year to come? 
Let's pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Fill our hearts and fill our homes with the love that heals our souls. Amen. Well, now we've come to that moment, that time on Christmas Eve, when we light candles and sing Silent Night. Now, I'm going to light my candle from the Advent wreath, from the Christ candle here in the sanctuary. I hope that you've got some candles ready so you can light them where you are at home. Go ahead and share the light of Christmas with one another as we all sing together, Silent Night, Holy Night. In just a moment, I'm going to give a word of blessing. After the blessing, there will be one more piece of Christmas music to send you into Christmas morning. Before I offer a blessing, I want to say thank you. Thank you for worshiping with your church family tonight. Thank you for being so patient and gracious through all of the technical difficulties and hard decisions we've had to make this year. Thank you most of all for embodying God's love in all the ways that you do. And now I invite you all to receive this word of blessing. May God fill your hearts and may God fill your homes with the love of all your neighbors, with the love of Jesus, with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. You are deeply loved.